Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Sachu Mathlali. Like all of us, I carry multiple identities. Matt has given me 45 minutes, and I'm going to use the 45 minutes to tell you four stories and four habits you might want to consider cultivating in these very bewildering times we find ourselves in. Four stories, four habits. Let me start with the first story. The first story is my own. I spend my childhood in a leprosy hospital in the city of Bangalore in India. My mother was a nurse and uh, all who've met her will tell you that she is the most loving, prayerful, caring person who actually spent most of her working life as a nurse uh, among people with leprosy. I'm not sure how much you know about leprosy. It is an unbearably cruel affliction. Although it affects are on the body, the real scars are on the mind. The real scars are relational. People with leprosy experience discrimination and exclusion from families and communities. In a collectivist society like in India, that is heartbreaking. My mother lived her life touching and curing people with leprosy. Here's what I've noticed even as a child. The people she served never lost their smile. These people who were the most excluded and discriminated people groups in the world seem to have the capacity to demonstrate joy. On the veranda of the nursing quarters where we lived, I remember my mother having conversations with people with leprosy. I can even now in my mind's eye see a lady called Narasama, her smile, and hear a guy called Rajapa who laughed out loud in a sense of joy and gratitude that they expressed. I ask, why? What is it that causes some of the most humiliated, excluded, and marginalized people in our world to be grateful and joyful? Have you ever seen something of that reality in your life? I wonder if God is at work on the edges, on the margins, in liminal and in between places around the world. The second story is that of Sami. Uh, this video produced by RLN Network, which is um, uh, established as part of Archbishop of Canterbury's Reconciliation Ministry. It's four and a half minutes long and it tells the story of Sami. And he tells a story and along the way describes his liminal space. Watch it. We live, we live under, under occupation. occupation. I grew, I grew up, up in a situation, situation where we witnessed and experienced, experienced the occupation every, every single, single day of my life. life. My, father my father was principal of an orphanage where the Israeli army would actually raid the orphanage. Orphan. So, so it was, it was a, a very direct, direct experience of tear gas, rubber bullets, bullets, yelling, yelling shouting, night raids that, that we had. had. And, and, and for me, I grew up in this reality. And, and, and the narrative, the narrative around, this around this reality is, is that you are justified in your hatred and, and resentful towards, towards them who are doing this to you. I could not understand how can you make peace with a people that want to destroy you. They don't even want to make peace with us. So as a Palestinian activist, I was very committed to non-violent resistance to end occupation. But at the same time, I was always challenged with what is really this conflict about? Is there, is there something, something hidden, hidden that we are not aware of that we need to address? But I never knew what it, what it was. And then American Jewish friends of mine invited me to this retreat called the Bearing Witness Retreat. And this retreat happens every year and they organize it in the death camps of Auschwitz and Bergenau in Poland. As Palestinians, we don't deny the Holocaust, but we don't affiliate ourselves with it. It's not our story, it's not our narrative. It has nothing to do with us. It's in the past. The reality of the occupation is what we live in now. Uh, but I decided to go there. And to be honest, that experience completely turned my life around. 
for several days we toured the campus itself, the location itself, the death camp, and saw everything that happened there. At one point, three of us decided to do something that was very unique. Myself as a Palestinian Christian, an American Jew, and a Turkish Muslim decided to spend the night in what's called the children's bunker. And it's a November night, and we have all the warm clothes and blankets and sleeping bags, and we were freezing. And just to imagine what those children who had nothing went through and experienced. And that was, I think, one of the deepest experiences that I had in my life. And so my whole life was turned around by this experience. Unless we address the traumas of the communities of this land, we will never achieve any real sense of peace. We will always look towards the other with mistrust, with doubt, with having hidden agendas and hidden tensions that will limit any scope of peacemaking that we could put them. Now, when I go to a checkpoint and I see an Israeli soldier with a gun, and he could even point this gun towards me, I would engage. I would ask the questions. Tell me your story. Tell me more about you. And so even if he's coming <laughs> yelling at me and shouting at me, if there is an opportunity to create that space, this is what I do. You know, in science they say one case can make or destroy a whole theory. So if the theory that people have that Palestinians and Israelis hate each other, you need one example to show that this theory is wrong. And I've seen hundreds of examples that prove that this theory is wrong. Palestinians and Israelis are living in conflict, are living in a time where there is hatred and resentment, but this is not embedded in us as a people. Jesus never said, negotiate a peace treaty with your enemy. He never said, resolve your conflict with your enemy. He never said, reach a political settlement with your enemy. You wanna follow me? Then. You follow my commandment. You love your enemy. And for me, that's become my journey. That was Sammy in some ways in a liminal space. That's the second of the story of Sami, that reality of asking the question if God really is at work on the edges, on the margins, in the liminal and the in-between places of our world. And that story of Sami perhaps indicates he might be. The third story is connected, but for perhaps from a Jewish perspective, is that of uh, Elie Weisel. The Nobel Peace Prize winner and a survivor of the Holocaust tells of his time in a concentration camp when he was forced alongside a few others to witness the hanging of two Jewish boys and one uh, Jewish man and the two people died and this young lad um, struggled on the gallows. Somebody behind Weisel muttered, where is God? Where is he? Weisel writes how he was hound by that question. Where is God in the midst of Holocaust? Where is he? And then he heard a voice softly within him saying, he is hanging there on the gallows. Where else? I wonder if God is at work on the edges, on the margins, in the liminal and in between places of our world. The fourth story is the story of Exodus in the First Testament. We find the story of the people of God who found themselves enslaved in Egypt. They entered Egypt as a large family and over a period of time found themselves enslaved in Egypt. And we are told in the page of Exodus that God heard their cry. 
I find that extraordinary that God hears the cries of people. God hears their cry and God chooses a man by the name of Moses to lead his people out of their slavery. So God's people enter the desert. The journey that should have taken two and a half weeks, two if you have a very fast donkey, a journey that should have taken two and a half weeks takes them 40 years. That is a very, very, very long walk. Exodus and the book of Numbers record the journey, but there is a difference. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who sadly died recently, writes, Exodus is a journey from, Numbers is a journey to. Exodus is the journey of escape from slavery in Egypt. Numbers is the journey to the brink of the promised land. Exodus is an exciting story. You have just been released from slavery. My chains have just come off. Numbers is a journey to take responsibility of the freedom. In that sense, the book of Numbers, Jonathan Rabbi Sachs says, is liminal space. It's the land in between. It's neither the starting point nor the destination. Numbers is a journey from the familiar to the unfamiliar. And all of us will experience this in our lives personally, communally, as a society, as a nation, as a world. Are you in one of those in-between places? Perhaps COVID-19 is bringing the experience of being in between, not there yet kind of feeling. For many of us, the journey into the land in between comes suddenly with a conversation that drops in like a bone. It has so many shapes to it. You're getting on with your job in your workplace. Your, job, your boss calls you in. You haven't got a job anymore. Your position is eliminated. That is a liminal space. It's a land in between. I don't love you anymore. It's a land in between. The voice that says the tumor is cancerous. It's a land in between. It could take the shape of a teenage daughter saying, I'm pregnant. It's a land in between. I'm having second thoughts about our wedding. Mom, I'm at the police station. How soon can you come? Your mother and I are getting a divorce. It's a land in between. We are moving. We think mom has COVID. How soon can you get to the hospital? It's the land in between. The land in between takes so many shapes in our lives. Do you know we all go through it? It takes various shades from employment to unemployment, from death to bereavement, from childhood to adulthood, from the familiar to the unfamiliar, from faithfulness to betrayal, from employment to retirement, from singleness to marriage, from the known to the unknown. What happens in bewilderment? I wonder if God is at work on the edges, margins, liminal and in-between places around our world. And as we read the book of Numbers, we discover the land in between is a fascinating places for at least two things to happen. It is a very fertile ground for complaint and meltdown on the one hand. It is also a place where transformational growth happens. And as we look at the in-between places of our world, we discover that God is at work in and through and sometimes despite us. He is at work on the edges, margins, liminal and in-between places of our world. My contention this morning is that he is most visible in our homes, in our workplaces, in our parks, in our schools, in our communities, 
in our churches, wherever our front line may be. He is visible in the habits that have its deep roots in the Judeo-Christian scriptures. With the Christian thinker, Christine Paul, I've chosen four habits that are interlinked. Habits that are conduit, that enable us to see God at work on the edges, margins, liminal, and in between places of our world. What are those four habits? The first one is the habit of gratitude. In the Bible, gratitude and grace are connected, both linguistically and theologically. Let me explain. The word gratitude comes from the Latin word gratia, which means grace. Similarly, in Greek, grace is charis and gratitude is eucharistia. Charis, eucharis, charis, eucharis share the same root. Gratitude and grace are connected. In other words, when we understand grace, we embrace gratitude for the Christian. Hallelujah is the first breath. That is our mode of operation. Grace and gratitude are connected. When we embrace grace, we are grateful. As I was uh, doing a series at the church that I am part of, uh, I've kind of put together 10 things that we can do in a pandemic to cultivate gratitude in our lives. So let me share these 10 things with you. Don't do it all at once. 10 ideas for you to cultivate gratitude, the first of our habits. Number one, acknowledge other people. There is power in the words we use. Tell a friend, tell a coworker, tell a spouse, tell a child what you really appreciate about them. Number two, who led you to Jesus? Who are the people who have contributed to who you are as a disciple? Have you ever thanked them for not being ashamed of the good news of Jesus? Give it a go. Number three, do some mirror work. Look at yourself in the mirror and uh, say something that you are grateful for yourself. I know some of us find that very difficult to do, but give it a go. You are made in the image of God. Number four, pray. Cultivate the habit uh, of prayer, especially uh, a prayer called examine. There are various versions of examine, uh, but the simplest is start with three things you would like to thank God for at the end of a given day. Number five, read scripture. In scripture, you hear the heartbeat of God. You see the grace of God. And as you know, when you understand grace of God, you can't help but be grateful. Number six, uh, all of us are receiving Amazon delivery drivers or whatever company you use. Uh, our postmen are working, our postwomen are working. Thank them. Thank them. Number seven, thanking people online. I'm not sure about you, but I spend far too much time online these days. Wherever your social medias are, Facebook, Twitter, these are, these are our front line. This is where we spend our time. This is where we are invited to our Christian discipleship. Take the opportunity to be grateful online. Number eight, look at examples of grateful people in your life and learn from them. I spoke to somebody last week who I think is such an extraordinarily grateful person. I asked them, how do you do it? And it was an incredibly learning experience. So who are the grateful people in your life you can learn from? Number nine, start a gratitude journal. Write down five things daily that you are grateful for in the last 24 hours. And number 10 is back to the roots. Gratitude and grace are connected. Ponder and pray. Check the authenticity of the grace you received. Because when you understand the grace of Jesus, gratitude just follows. The second habit I want to talk through is the habit of promise making and promise keeping. Don't worry, not all of this has 10 points. I'm going to be much quicker on this one. You see, uh, promise making and promise keeping is a second habit I want to talk about 
and this can be cultivated in a pandemic. You see, your story and mine can be told in terms of our commitments. I'm not sure who uh, your commitments are to, uh, but my commitments are to Katie, my wife, uh, our four children. I've got uh, elderly parents in India. I've got siblings in India. I've got two churches that I'm part of here in Kent, in Gillingham. I am connected to the parish because I'm a parish priest. I am got relationships there. I've got a few friendships. I've got a team that I work with. I've got a mentor and I invest in a few people in the hope that they will become a better Christian leaders than I'll ever be. These are my commitments. Your commitments will be very different from mine, of course. Take the time to actually take a piece of paper and write down where your commitments are. Now, here's the thing. If your story and mine can be told in terms of our commitments, where are those commitments for you? And importantly, what is the basis of those relationships? In other words, are they contractual relationships or are they covenantal relationships? You're asking me, Saji, what is the difference between uh, contractual and covenantal? Now, these are very sweeping generalizations, but contractuals are conditional. Covenantal relationships are unconditional. Contractual is professional. Covenantal is relational. A contract is signed. A covenant is sealed. It's cut in the covenant is the language the Hebrew people use. A contract is legally blind, binding while a covenant is spiritually binding. One exchanges goods and services for the other. The other gives in order not necessarily to receive anything. In other words, in a contract, you give to get. In a covenant, you give to give. Now, back to your relationships. I want to ask the question, what is the basis of your relationship? Is it a contract or is it a covenant? Let me push you slightly a bit more. What is a covenant? The word covenant in the Hebrew uh, is the Hebrew word berit. Uh, it's where we get the word testament from, as in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Covenant is the word berit, the basis of scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, the First Testament and Second Testament, as I like to call it, is, is actually based on the reality of who God is. The Bible is a covenant. Not only is this the basis of the Bible, covenant has been the foundation of a relationship with God throughout biblical history. From Adam and Eve in the garden to Noah and Abraham, from Moses to the patriarchs and later kings of Israel, covenant has been the established form of a human divine relationship. These covenants bound individuals. It bound tribes, it bound families, it bound whole nations to God. The most significant human divine covenant was made when Jesus died and he rose again. Remember, on the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took the cup of wine, gave God thanks. He gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Saying this drink is the blood of the covenant. Do you see it? Our relationship with God in Christ Jesus is a covenant that is cut by the blood of Jesus. It cost God everything. So relationship with this covenant making God prompts us to be people who make and keep promises. Not ten Three things perhaps for you to consider practicing this in your life and mine. Take any one of those relationships. Perhaps if you are married, take the one with your spouse. The promises that we make to each other, are they a contract or are they a covenant? What steps can we take for a marriage to be truly a covenant? Number two. What is your relationship with your local church like? Is it covenantal or is it contractual? Or even worse, 
commodified. It is the church a covenantal community where making and keeping promises are the norm? Or is it a consumeristic community where we are patterned in the life of this world, where we say, ah, what can I get out of my church now? In other words, I heard someone say, I didn't get much out of my church this Sunday. Number three, perhaps surprisingly, you might say, slow down in making promises. Make fewer promises. Make deliberate promises. And the key to make, making fewer and more deliberate promises is to ask the question, God, what are you asking me to do with my life? The first practice is that of gratitude. The second is promise making. The third is truth telling. Did you know Oxford Dictionaries just a few years ago selected post-truth as their word of the year? Katie Steinmetz, who writes uh, for The Times commenting on the post-truth word, says this. The word post-truth captures the culture's mood and preoccupations. Although the word dates back to at least 1992, its usage has ballooned by, listen, to thousand percent that may seem shockingly high but pause to reflect has it not been the case that the facts are dismissed as just getting in the way of good agenda driven story isn't it true that sensitivities to offense outrage and personal preferences have shaped culture and now determine the very words we are allowed to say in a supposedly free society she concludes her article by saying it's hard to think of a word more suited than post-truth to describe the spirit of the age. Wow. One of the most extraordinary trials of all time is when Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate. Pilate claimed to have the authority of the most uh, world's most powerful empire. Jesus stood before Pilate and claimed to be truth incarnate. Jesus says that his authority and his message aren't based on the deviations of power or feelings, but on unchanging truth. Let me read a few verses from John 18. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people, your own chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would have fought to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Oh, you are a king then asked Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? asked Pilate. And with this, he went out. With this, he went out. Pilate asks and then walks out before Jesus can answer. Someone I was reading said this, it makes for a dramatic exit, but a pitiful display. Pilate squanders the opportunity of a lifetime for a rhetorical punchline. So many people in our culture, in a post-truth culture, do the same. They ask, what is truth? And like Pilate, walk away. There's a whole lot of things we could say about truth, but truth in the Bible is one thing, is a person. Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 14 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in the same chapter, the Holy Spirit, he is called the spirit of truth. How might we in these bewildering pandemic times embody truth like our savior. Finally and briefly, the habit, uh, the fourth the habit is the habit of cultivating, cultivating hospitality. 
You see, the first word God speaks to human beings in the Bible, the God's very first commandment is eat freely. Can you believe it? God's invitation to people at the very start is to eat, eat freely. The last words out of God's mouth in the Bible, his final commandment, if you like, is drink freely in Revelation chapter 22. Everything in between these two commands is a table. And on that table, we feast in our hearts with thanksgiving on the very bread of life and the cup of salvation, Jesus the Christ. Let's not forget, they killed Jesus because of the way he ate. I long for a day, I'm sure you do, when we can break bread together again. I long for a day when we can pour wine again. I long for a day when we can welcome with open arms and share our tables. But don't forget, hospitality is not just eating and drinking. It is also becoming the kind of people who reflect a hospitable God. When we were still far off, Jesus met us in who he is. He brought us home, dying and living. He declared grace, opened the gates of glory. And so we can share his life. As I said, in these tough times, we can share his life, perhaps through gratitude, promise keeping, truth telling and hospitality. Okay, let's pray. Oh God, when evil darkens our world, give us light. When despair numbs our soul, give us hope. When we stumble and fall, lift us up. When we are in between places, give us faith. When nothing seems sure, give us trust. When we lose our way, be our guide. And Father, in these tough times in our world, we ask you to cultivate good things in our lives. And so I pray that you will cultivate gratitude, promise keeping, truth telling and hospitality in each one of our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, folks, for joining us. It's really, really good to see you. God bless.